Well, welcome, guys. The first question I really want to talk about today are what are the t different types of data that organizations use, and how does that sort of driving their new value proposition? I think a company deals with a lot of different types of data, depending on the industry. So if you are in a consumer-based industry, you're looking at your customer data, what their buying patterns are, what their trends are. If it's healthcare, you're looking at the types of um, diagnosis that they may have, the medications that they're on, what sort of metabolic or diagnostics that they have. Um, most companies also deal with their own financial and internal data. So I think it's industry specific. Right now there's a big focus on consumer data and how you leverage that consumer data, um, as well as internal data that you're using to drive your business and financials. Sundar, what do you think? So that's great, and I'll contextualize it in the con for the technology services industry. Mm -hmm. there's, um, there's the customer data, which is everything from service mix, pricing, contracting. Um, then there's operational data, which could be utilization, skill sets, attrition, which is a big topic right now. And underlying all that is really the business that all these services companies are providing this value to. So. Yeah, if you think about it through the service provider lens, you're right. They're yeah. really looking at ways to manage their business, but also drive more business. Mm -hmm. I know when service providers come to ISG, the types of data they're looking for us to give them information on are not just you know what deals are in the market, what size deals are coming up for renewal, but how are other service providers bundling their services together? How are they pricing them? What are the levers that they're using for changing up services mix? What are the specific SLAs? And then you get into um, not just um, quantitative data, but qualitative data. What types of clauses are being um, taken out of, um, of contracts? So right now they're asking about COLA. They're asking about termination of services. There's a lot of mix going on with the service provider community and types of data that they're looking for to make sure that they understand the market and are driving in the right direction. Yeah. Steve, I know you have thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think you guys are both bringing up great points. And I think to steal the phrase, I think data is a new oil, right? Mm -hmm. And I think when we look at every organization, the integration of analytics, the integration of so many sensors, the integration of the customer experience, mm -hmm. The fact that we're tracked on our mobile devices now, we're tracked on our web, cookies, everything. We've got data everywhere. So organizations have to figure out what's their core asset and how do they think about monetizing that data to drive a different value stream. You know, Kathy, if your world, if I think about ISG, we want to monetize price data, mm -hmm. cost data, mm -hmm. service level agreements, contract durations, the things that we talk about on the index. You know, if I'm a service provider, I want to help organizations develop structures, data analytics, teams, organizations to help enterprises do it. And as you started out, every company is going to have a different set of data. And I would say likely even every vertical or sub-vertical or micro-vertical, whatever we want to call it, is going to have different assets. And the trick is to step back, I think, and say, how do we use it to make real insights and real decisions? And then what can we monetize from this? I think data is also driving new partnerships in ways we've never seen before. Um, you'll see competitors coming together to bring their data into a, a single data set so that they have more insights. So we were working with a, a medical community and um, they were looking, uh, w one organization had developed a way to look at cancer biopsies and they had a set of information, but really to get AI and intelligence around it, they needed more. So they opened it up to what would be considered maybe not their normal partners yeah. to, to build those data sets so they could drive better um, results for the communities that they served. Yeah. And I think that happens a lot now. There's different partnerships because you can bring in data together and just have more deeper insights than what you might have had on your own. So I think both of you bring up an interesting point, which is there's data that you get from your business mm -hmm. and there's external data. And the external data brings a lot of context. And when you put the two together, so as you're thinking about your data strategy, it's natural to start with your own data. Right. But thinking about the outside data that's available and accessible and can add more color detail to your ex internal data is an important aspect to keep in mind. That's a great point. The external data that you can just access through an API or a microservice or some type of subscription is really becoming, I think, more important to enhancing the, your data that you have. And so all these data partnerships are either through 
subscription services, um, or creating partnerships with people that you might not have in the past. Yeah, well, even look at our own business. So if you look at our ISG Executive Insights, mm -hmm. right, it's an API-driven capability that really right. says, we, have an, we know an awful lot about your contracts, your mm -hmm. capabilities, what you can do, but we buy data from other firms that enhance that. We do third-party risk management. Mm -hmm. We do financial assessments. We do ESG mm -hmm. capabilities. Bringing that We're in now. We're buying data from Dun & Bradstreet to integrate it in. So there's so many things that we can do that just so much value add for the end client because it enhances that overall experience with the data components that we build. So mm -hmm. I think that's a brilliant question. And, uh, and something organizations will look forward to moving forward with. Great conversation. You, you know, the next thing that's sort of on my mind is how do organizations really think about their data monetization strategy? There's so many out there, and maybe for both of you, both from a, an ISG perspective, a service provider perspective, and really even an enterprise perspective, what, what should our data monetization strategies be? I'll, I'll start there. Um, I would start thinking about is the data by itself valuable? or is the data powering new experiences and new moments of insight? And so your monetization strategy could be just giving access to the data in some way, or it could be building experiences and use cases that are driven by data. And I'll take a classic example, um, benchmarking, which you can talk to, is a great example of a data monetization where you're not really always giving away all the data, but you're allowing whether it's a price benchmark, whether it's a cost benchmark, it's the power of the data, but you're really allowing people to take a specific point in time insight, which can often be more valuable, both from a monetization perspective as well as to the customer. That's good. So there's different aspects to how you think about yeah. it, data and insights. Yeah. Kathy, I think that's thoughts? a great point. I know that when we look at the data assets that we have, we really sit back and think, is this data we should just give access to direct? Let people make their own assumptions, make their own connections with the data. We have this data, it's in a structured format, but we'll just give you access through an API. Or is this data something we should curate and deliver back more of a experience, as you said, Sundar? Give them an experience with the data that shows them what to think about in the data, gives them output maybe in form of, of dashboards um, that can be customized to them and what their needs are. So we go back and forth and sometimes one data set will be both. Yeah. We may use our rates database, for example, to expose it to people to just pull rates at their leisure, or we'll curate it out so you can say, okay, I like to ask a question of the rates database. What are we seeing, for example, in a specific industry with specific skill sets? What are the day rates? What are the averages? And that's just something we curate into a dashboard versus just giving them a full dump of the data, as you would. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, from an enterprise standpoint, I've got two good examples that I always think about. And it always goes to the core of really what are your assets and what are your core enterprise assets. The, so the first one is the transport for London, getting on the tube. Mm -hmm. What's their core asset? What do they want to do? They want people to ride the tube, right? They want to not only do it from a monetary standpoint, but reduce congestion on the streets and everything else within London. So TFL is brilliant. What do you have to do to get more people on the tube? You got to make it really easy. How do you go from station A to station B? It's the experience, the experience, user experience. Exactly. So TFL did something amazing. They took all of their data, they made it completely available free. And then all of a sudden what you had is lots of people creating apps, creating different experiences that would drive people to the subs, you know, to the tube, which was brilliant. So they didn't monetize the data itself, but they monetized the experience to drive it. Now the other example. So they kind of crowdsource their data. They sort of, they absolutely yeah. crowdsource uh -huh. their data intentionally. Interesting. And you had a lot of startups that were able to take their data for free now, mm -hmm. create their own businesses, and they sell things. Whether it's on the app and they sell advertising or other things, it's all about that experience of right. writing the tube. And it created a community around the tube that Entire they wouldn't ecosystem. have created on their own. They couldn't have created no, it on their own. No, that's cool. They couldn't have created it on their own. I love that. And they not just crowdsource the data, they actually crowdsource the design or the thinking Absolutely. about the experience. The insights, right. you said, right. wow. exactly. The, the other one that really strikes me, and again, it's always about core assets, is John Deere. Mm -hmm. John Deere's a tractor company in the middle of central Illinois, right? Moline, Illinois. It's not exactly known as the heartland for data. But John Deere said, you know, four or five years ago, what's my core asset? And it wasn't the tractor, it wasn't the farm equipment. Their core asset was the fact that their equipment was on every farm in America. Mm -hmm. 
So that meant they understood the soil, they understood the climate, mm -hmm. they understood the environment, they understood what was happening with the nutrients in the ground. And they said, you know what, maybe our data, our core assets, is sensors that we can plant in the ground because we're on all of this, these acres of land. We have the tractors. Mm -hmm. We provide and sell that data to climate companies. Mm -hmm. We sell it to the Weather Channel. We sell it to IBM. We sell it to Monsanto. We sell it to Archer Daniel Midlands. We sell it to ConAgra. Things that completely monetize their data, but it wasn't things that you would say, well, John Deere's going to create a digital twin and sell that. Mm -hmm. So setting back and really thinking, what's your core asset? What are the things that differentiate, differentiate you in the market? And how do you create data monetization strategies around that? You know, Facebook's easy, right? They want eyeballs. Right. So the more eyeballs they get, they're going to sell data mm -hmm. to attract advertisers to get our eyeballs. Mm -hmm. Easy model, Google, easy model. But I think every enterprise has a strategy to do that mm -hmm. once they understand what their core assets are. I was thinking about something someone said in the sessions we've been having the last couple of days, and it's like, don't design for the past or what you have now. Think about designing for the future. Um, and, and that seems simple, but really I think sometimes we have to startle ourselves out of you know, the, the status quo and think about what is the future right. and what should we be doing different and being creative. This brings up a really good point, though, about data and really offering it up like the, the London Tube example. Did they have any worries or concerns about protecting that data? I mean, they just gave all the data to the citizens. How do, how do, we, how do companies think about protection now and, and, and managing data? That's a brilliant question. I mean, the whole data privacy thing and data sovereignty piece and data security piece, data rights is such a tough, tough topic right now. Um, you know, so if I break it down and look at a couple perspectives, again, sort of from a consumer standpoint and enterprise standpoint, as a consumer, I don't necessarily want all my data used. So I don't like cook, turning cookies on where they can track me on everything. And what, if I'm looking at barbecue grills and I'm reading the Wall Street Journal and all of a sudden I get a barbecue grill ad in the Wall Street Journal, I don't like that experience, mm -hmm. right? It didn't work me, so I like turning those, those cookies off to do it. But I get how valuable that is. Mm -hmm. I think the key thing is trust. I think if companies and enterprises tell people how they're using the data, mm -hmm. and you have a relationship that goes beyond just a customer relationship, but I'm getting value and getting value back from it, I think we're open to it. So I think organizations and companies are going to have to look at it, at least from a consumer perspective, that would be my first thought. So I'll take the um, other extreme. The consumer experience is quite often driven by personalization. Yep. In our own business in research, there is data about a provider, about a client that is extremely confidential, mm -hmm. but in aggregate and in an anonymized manner can be hugely insightful. And just knowing that and having the controls to make sure you're never exposing the confidentiality. So you can still use the data in a way that is insightful to different stakeholders. So understanding the attributes of data and what's okay, what's not okay, kind of in almost plain speak, is an important aspect of decision making whenever you're thinking about data. You bring up a really good point because in my role as a chief data officer, I lay awake at night thinking about we expose data that we're not supposed to expose. And we have rigorous processes around the ability to anonymize that data because you're right, there's value in building groups of data together that are anonymized that can drive really good insights versus exposing single points of data. So there's, there's different types of data that you may want to expose or with the transparency, just making everyone aware of how you're going to use their data. Okay, that's great, but you also have to protect that data, um, not only from a uh, proprietary perspective, but you also need to think about how your users are using the data and make sure that they're using it appropriately, that they understand the data. I worry about that as well. Do people really understand what they're looking at because using data incorrectly can be dangerous? See, I think we're going to get further and further away from a human or an individual being able to understand mm -hmm. how that data is being used. And if you think about the millions of APIs and microservices that are out there, and all the different ways that data is being used, right? Amadeus, airline, passenger reservations, all they're doing is saying, is a seat available or seat not available, right. right? How many people in seat apps do we see, though, where people use it differently? And you go in and see, you know, do you want this amount of leg room, that amount of leg room, do you want this type mm -hmm. of seat, do you want that? But, you know, there's all sorts of aspects of that that change that experience, similar to what TFL we talked through. 
I don't think we can control that downstream. Just like the deals that we do with companies today, if I'm getting ESG data from somebody, mm -hmm. they can't dictate how I use that data. They don't necessarily interpret the data for it. It's got to be developed in a way that is consumable across the supply chain that we no longer control. And that's going to be a different level of thinking for all of us as we think through how do we expose data, which will also drive through our strategy of what data needs should be exposed. Mm -hmm. That's right. So. And I would even go to the extent, if data can be misused, assume it will be misused. So just con protecting it through contracts is probably not good enough. It means you have to design to protect that exposure and prevent that misuse. But it, at some point, what you're saying in the, in, the, in the value stream, you have to just let go. You just have to let go. You I just think. have to let go. Yeah, I think when you design your API strategy and your microservices mm -hmm. strategy and your overall data monetization strategy, you have to assume it's going to be used in ways that we can't even fathom now, and you just have to let go. I'll so try. you provide things. I know it's hard try, for us, right? I'll try, let, I'll try go. To let go. Oh my God! <laughs> you know, I'm the only one that knows about this price right. and how to put it together. What yeah, do you okay. mean somebody can use it in a way I don't understand? Yeah. But I think we got to design to let go, quite frankly. And once you do that, I think that's when you get the exponential growth, though, in data strategies. Which is why I'm such a huge proponent of data APIs versus right. just data services. Right. I can't imagine what a Wall Street analyst is going to do with my data. You know, I could put a screen together for them. I could try to compete with Bloomberg and put a terminal together or something else. But I'd much rather say, here's some great insights. You go combine it with other insights in ways that you may figure out and tell me what's going on in it. And I think that's how we have to think going right. forward. Well, that's why we're, we're good together, Steve, because I'm a little more control. You're a little no, more no, let no, go. No. <laughs> and it works. <laughs> and it works. <laughs>